So despite being told about bloody sheets during the interview, and despite you suspecting this is where the attack occurred, you execute a search warrant on April the 24th, and you don't collect the sheets. The, the which sheets? The, the, she, the sheets that didn't have blood on them, no. Did you, they, did you they collect were, any sheets? I don't believe any sheets were collected because they didn't appear to be evidence at the time because there's no blood on them. There was no blood on any of the bedding, even the foam bed. Did it, you, we looked and looked. There was no blood. We couldn't see it. Did you pull any of the sheets off the shelf that you've got so many photographs of? I hadn't had a chance to look at his video yet, so it wasn't pertinent. The sheets on the shelf... I didn't, I didn't notice that they, would they, how would I know there's supposed to be two sets of sheets there? Detective, Until I saw the video a week before. There's one set of sheets, it's in a, in a container, it's on the half shell, okay? But that's not pertinent to me, I don't even know why it's there or, or how, what relevance it is until I see the video in his phone. What about the balled up sheets in the linen closet next to the Swiffer? Appeared to be clean. Now we're looking for blood soaked sheets, like we're seeing a lot of blood. Blood on the floor, blood in the bathroom, blood on her. We're looking for blood-soaked sheets and blood-soaked clothing, and we're not finding that. Uh, Those did not look blood-soaked to us at all. Did you pull them out and look at them? I did not, no. Did you photograph them what, on, on, on April the 24th? Did you look at them on April the 24th? They were they're photographed in the closet. They're photographed in the closet. Were they I did not pull them examined? out. By our searchers, I could not tell you that. I don't know. Weren't you directing the search? No, my sergeant was. I wasn't there, sir. My sergeant was in charge. Did you explain to them your concerns over the odd, your, your perceived odd comments about the, the period sex and them having intercourse at the end of her menstrual cycle? Certainly, I was not able to go into all of that with the searchers on scene. All I said to them was, he's saying there's blood on the bed everywhere. Look on the bed. There's blood on the bed everywhere. And they said they did. They said they did, and then we did a final walkthrough at five, five o'clock in the morning. We didn't see it either. You, we just didn't take the bed apart, and we probably should have. You made comment that you thought the bed was made in an unusual manner. The bed looked really, really, really made in haste. So there another clue that something might have happened on this bed. Correct. That's why they took it apart. That's why they took the mattresses off. They took everything off. The slats, Detect both mattresses, Detective. both foams, those sheets. They found nothing. The blanket, they found nothing. Detective, how many search warrants did you execute on that property? Three. Okay, so on April the 24th, was any effort made to preserve the sheets or the bed? Effort made to preserve the sheets or the bed. We did not understand where the blood could have gone. We didn't see it, so no. Okay, let me, let me stop you there. What about, didn't, isn't it true that on April the 24th that suspected blood was seen on the edge of the slats that were located on the floor under the bed. I asked those to be collected on April 24th. I asked weren't. both of them. And they, were they weren't. And when I found that out, we went back. And so let's stick with search warrant number one, though, because mm -hmm. we're talking about April the 24th here. So you've got blood on slats that are belong to the bed. That are under the bed on the floor. They weren't, they weren't connected to the other slats. They belong to this bed. They're a piece of the bed. There are other slats that make up this bed that are still attached. Yeah, these had broken away and they were on the floor and they had tinged blood on them. My very first comment to CSI Crosby before we even left to go write the search warrant, that looks like blood to me. Figure out how it got there. So you already knew that there was blood on the bed. Under the bed, on those slats. And then you got information from David Tronis about bloody sheets that no. you thought was odd. He said there was blood everywhere, because I didn't even ask him on the bed. I said, are you trying to tell me there's blood somewhere? He said, there's blood everywhere. Didn't I said, where? On the mattress, uh, the, the, the um, bedspread, on the sheets, on the side of the bed. It's everywhere. And I thought, well, that's odd from the end of a menstrual cycle, and she's not even wearing, didn't look like she was even wearing underclothes. Going back again, you're at the, you're at the station interviewing uh, Mr. Tronis, who's giving you information about bloody sheets, right? He bloody sheets was, and blood on the bed. There's blood everywhere. And he told you that they swapped them out and told you what day they did and how they dealt with both the mattress pad and the sheets. Isn't that true? 
that they stripped the bed on Monday. They stripped the whole thing. They, they left the bloody bed apparently all of Saturday and Sunday and stripped it on Monday after Jackson went to school. That's what he said. So in seeing the sheets from and with the 30 something stains on them and knowing that there was only a couple of spots that belonged to Shanti, you still are of the opinion that there was a violent attack on that bed because the evidence is, is supportive of that? I am of the opinion that something happened on the, on the edge of that bed where everything that she owns or everything that she would take off is on that nightstand. And then we've got blood that has drained down that side rail and been cleaned on the top, then we've got an L bracket with blood behind it, and then blood drips down underneath it. And it's right in the center, right in the center, and then it drips down underneath it, and then it hits those the tinge on the ends of those slats. You Something happened at that event. You don't know Something when that blood. There. You don't it know. Does not transfer from her body because she's not close enough. You don't know when that blood was deposited there, do you? No. You don't know if it happened at a completely different location. When that blood, mean? when that blood came to be on that bed, that it could, have, the bed could have been in the main house. I think that's a stretch. You've got the slats that are under the bed that look apparent to me, fresh, absolutely fresh blood. And that's what I said to CSI Crosby. That is fresh blood. Figure out how it got there. That is fresh blood. But yet you didn't. I'm not in charge of the CSIs. When I learned that we didn't have the slats, we went back. Let's talk, continue to talk about 424. You're not giving any guidance to these folks of what areas you think are important that should be documented, searched, or I taken was, as an I, I'm not there. I'm not there. I can't. I can't be in two places at once. You did a walk around the scene, correct? Before we went back out. at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we walked with the CSIs. Okay. And at that point, did you have any input that was helpful to them? And did you go yes. back and see if the slats had been collected? I gave them instruction. And we went to make the death notification. I told them exactly what we walked it. We went and, we, and I told them exactly what I wanted. And then we went outside. We went down to the garage. We walked to the property and we went to make the death notification. It's an 800 square foot apartment, correct? I don't have any idea. Isn't it true that you didn't search the nightstand on April the 24th? I don't know if I, if I searched it or if someone else searched it. Okay, well, if it was searched, wouldn't there be photographs of it as such? Not necessarily, no. No, but when Barb and I went back, we absolutely went through that because we were looking for her ring. And, and when you're talking about it, was that on April the 30th or oh, May no. the 24th? It was April 24th, as soon as, we, as, soon as he said it, that the ring was on her finger and I knew it wasn't. That was, that was my sole focus when we went back. So it's your testimony that you went back and you looked in that nightstand and you searched through that for the ring. I was looking for her ring. And you located ring boxes. I ring boxes that were empty, and then that tiny, the reason I keyed in on that tiny costume jewelry is because it looked like a wedding band, and it wasn't. It ended up being, like, pliable. Detective, CSI was still at the scene with you on 424 when you were doing this? Correct. And no one thought it was important to your investigation to take photographs of this search? They took a lot of photographs of that search. You, is your, you believe that they took photographs on 424 of the nightstand and specifically those jewelry boxes oh i don't know if they if they did that or not i we searched i searched the entire loft for that that's why we we're there for two hours i was looking for the ring i know detective sharp was looking at a lot of the finances she was trying to get looking at a lot of the notepads i was looking for the ring if you're looking for the ring and you find jewelry you found a diamond stud earring correct we have pictures of the diamond stud earring, yes. You open up a drawer right next to the bed of the night, that's the nightstand, correct? With no jewelry. There wasn't a ring in that drawer? It, you're, this is different. I'm, not, I'm looking for a diamond ring, a diamond wedding ring and a diamond engagement ring. I'm not looking for costume jewelry. That's not what I was looking for. You found two empty boxes, though. Correct. Which had helpful information to your investigation, did it not? Not, not to my knowledge on 424. I didn't learn about H&Q until we interviewed Sam. When Samantha told us that that's where the ring was purchased, then I was like, oh, I saw that. I saw that ring box. It was empty. It said H&Q, but I didn't know that until we interviewed Sam. I didn't even know Sam existed. So you're looking for rings, uh, for a ring, and you find empty ring boxes, but you don't consider them significant enough to photograph that. They were, they were completely insignificant. I'm looking for her wedding set. 
because he said it's on her finger and I knew it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, let's go ahead. The interview, you were asking a lot of questions about uh, the, the, his memory of his encounter with Shanti after he entered the apartment that afternoon, right? Yes. And the, at some point, you even stop asking him about his memory and you start asking him to guess about what happened. Isn't that true? You'd have to be more specific, so I don't know what you mean. You, you ask him to guess how she uh, suffered those injuries. Oh, I asked him what he thought her cause of death was. And when he started to explain what he thought it was and what he was guessing or maybe even hoping it was, you started to tear him apart because you didn't like his answer. Isn't that correct? No, I, we witnessed it. I didn't tear him apart. You didn't go from treating him kind to calling him a liar? Objection. That's the evidence rule. Thanks. On 424, you didn't search the main house. The main house, meaning the one under construction? The main house. No, we did not. 35 square, 3,500 square feet of construction? Sir, I didn't even think it was safe to walk in there. It's an active but, construction site. Mm -hmm, active construction site. I wanted photographs of it, so um, we, I had Stacy do that on 430, but I wasn't even sure we were supposed to be in there. Ladders, tools, it was actively under construction, construction was it not? I don't know if it was actively under construction, no. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, there was, it was under construction, but actively, like people showing up every day, we never saw that. Did you see a ladder in the uh, main house? On the first day, no. On the, on the 30th? On the 30th, yes, we went in. You didn't process the main house for prints or DNA? In the construction site? Correct. No, absolutely not. You didn't process any of the doors uh, for suspected blood prints or signs of forced entry? We didn't see, we didn't see blood, no. I, I didn't have any indication that what happened to Shanti in an upstairs loft had anything to do with the interior of that construction site. There was no indication that would lead us in there. You, no blood trail, there were no testimony, there was nothing that would lead us in there. Isn't it true that it's an access point to the uh, garage apartment and through the hatch that you can get across to the now, top door? The door was locked. The upstairs door was locked to the loft. It's your memory? I checked it as soon as I went upstairs. That door was locked. I even, I even unlocked it and walked out there. So if we had testimony that the top door to the outside deck was unlocked, that would be counter to your memory? I walked upstairs, and the first thing after I checked the lock downstairs is I checked that door. And then before I left the, in the morning, at between 5 and 7, I walked out there on the roof and looked at the gargoyles, walked the entire roof looking for evidence in case anything was thrown out there. And isn't it true that there is an uh, access point that you can get from the main house to the garage apartment without going up the front yes, steps? But, yes, but I did, not, I did not go in there, but I saw it, yes. Okay. Can that door to the loft be locked from the inside and, and you pull it shut? From uh, the inside or the outside? Inside. I unlocked it and walked out there. Thank you. I checked the lock. It was locked, and then I unlocked it and walked on the roof. On 424, the bathtub had a peculiar stain. Is that fair to say? The bathtub, to me, looked like it had a blood stain, a diluted blood stain. Well, when you say, and, and that's what I'm referring to, the, when we talk about this rose-colored stain in the tub, when you're looking at the photographs with the enhancements before and, and after the enhancements, it becomes clear that there's a detection of blood that was pooled and diluted with water and became like almost a coating of the tub surface itself, right, once, once it drained? It, it, the ring appeared that that's probably how high the water was. And it was pretty consistent all the way around the tub, pretty uniform? Yes. So the entire white tub was stained with this rose color, right? Yes. Okay. Bathroom's pretty small? Yes. So if someone is coming in from the apartment into the bathroom door, what you're seeing is the tub in front of you, correct? Yes. And the toilet's to your left? And the vanity, and yes. vanity, right. But if there's an individual who's before you facing away, they're covering up a good bit of this tub if they're in the position that Mr. Tronis describes to you as being like back to him, back legs to him, and hunched over, correct? Submerged 
at an angle, face down, taking up pretty much most of the tub. And we heard submerged. He says the water was running and a little bit inconsistent, you say, on the speed that the water is running. From the trickle that he heard to the, to the where he said the dial was, yes. So what he heard, what he thought he heard, versus what he was able to visibly confirm when he went in. Correct. And the body was wet? The what? Shanti's body was wet? No. Her hair was wet? Damp, maybe. So da All right, so damp. It wasn't dry. it was dry. full of blood. It wasn't dry, was it? It was messy. Um, I think the medical examiner said it was damp, and, it was, and there was some blood in it. And what about the clothing? That was wet and damp, too, wasn't it? Uh, he said her top was damp. I watched him do it. His top, he, he did it, and I watched him do it. And he said the top was damp, and the shorts were a little more wet. Her skin was not. So in the vein of a long-haired person laying over into some bit of water and being pulled out of a tub, that if the water is running down their hair, that it would pull on their shirt and uh, perhaps on, on the shorts. From her hair? Or from being in the water. Or, or, I mean, if, if part of her body's in the water. Should she have been soaking wet, in my opinion? Yes. Well, and let's not talk about completely submerged to the definition of like how much of her body was in there because he gave some things that you thought were inconsistent with how much water and how much of her was in, in the water. Isn't that correct? No, I think he straightened that out. He, he, that's why we went over it. I mean, details matter, right? So the truth is in the details. And he, I think he explained what part of her was out and what part of her was in, what part of her was bent, where her legs were, where he saw blood. I think he explained that fairly well, um, with which part of her was legs were bent and stiff and everything was stiff and cold. David described blood on the ledge of the tub and hair in the drain? Yes. And that was there? Um, he said he heard, he saw her hair floating, and then he heard the tub draining when he pulled her out. So whether or not he went back to see her hair in the drain, I don't know, but he saw the hair floating. And then when he pulled her out, he heard it draining as he was to getting her out of the tub. So hearing a tub drain is usually when it's just about out of water, right? I'm not sure. Okay. I think you can hear it as, as soon as you flip the switch. We discussed that there was not extensive blood on the bed. We didn't find any blood until we went back and disassembled it. And other than the blood, which you considered fresh on the slats that weren't collected on the 24th, you found no blood underneath the bed. Correct. You found no cleaning products and bloody rags consistent with the cleanup of a crime scene. Well, it was trash day that morning. You found no um, towels other than the white towel from the bathroom that had a trace amount of blood on it? Correct, and the yellow one. And the yellow one, which had blood on it as gold, well. Gold, I'm sorry. Um, forgive my color blindness. But yeah, I think, I think he said gold. I don't want to mis misinterpret him. Towels and evidence and, and such, okay. but there's also photographs on it. You were able to see that the towel was there? Yes. And that it was wet? Yes. And that it had blood on it? Yes. Let's talk about your interview. You actually entered, entered the uh, room, it said about 917, is that what your? 915. 915. And it's your testimony at that point, you didn't consider David a suspect? I uh, did not. I just needed to straighten out the inconsistencies. The officers told us what they uh, had observed, what their thought process was, uh, what they were thinking. And um, my job is, I'm a lot, obviously a lot more trained than them. So my job is to um, just find out what happened in more detail from him. All right, and you talked about some of the methods that you used in order to gain his confidence and get him to open up to you. Those were somewhat evident on your- I, I think the, 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 what I talked about was later, with the minimizing and, and all of that was later. In the beginning, I'm just gonna ask him what happened. I just, I just need to know what happened and follow the evidence. So you go from asking questions to attempts at manipulating. <laughs> um, manipulating him to try and get him to say something that isn't true? No, absolutely not. No, I, I think we challenged him on the evidence that did not support his assertion of what occurred. And, you know, that is, that is what we're supposed to do. Um, that's my job. I have to challenge the evidence that doesn't make sense to his story, and it's his story, so we challenged him. So, and his story, and something you took an amazing amount of exception to, is the fact that he slept in the garage. 
I don't think I took an amazing amount of exception to that. Did I find it odd for newlyweds to sleep in a hot garage with the dogs on a couch when there's a perfectly good couch upstairs or the king size bed? We had questions about that. He explained their thinking and I wear a CPAP, so I'm familiar. Um, I understand what he was saying, but even when Jackson's not there, he's not sleeping with her. Um, so That's not exactly what he told you, right? He, he told you that he did sleep with her on Saturday night and into the Sunday. And before that, it had been some time. So, I mean, well, and that's and before Before that, there had been a period where Shanti was not feeling well. Isn't that true? Well, that was February and March. I mean, that was, that was, that was six weeks earlier. Okay, so, but now it, we're into April. Right, the end of April, and it had been some time. So you've He's got, sleeping uh, with the dogs in the garage. I thought it was odd. Construction in the main house. Not inhabitable. Right, and, but that wasn't the case the entire time they were married, was it? The entire time they were married, yes. The entire time they lived there, no. Okay, the entire time that they lived there, they, for a good portion of time, they lived in the main house. Yes. They, it was uh, only they, about 16 months that they were living in the garage apartment. I think it was more like oh, just over two years. They kept the kitchen, uh, but they were living back there for over two years. They kept the kitchen, I think, until December. You suspected an unhappy marriage. Yes. Though. Or a stressful marriage. The um, presence of an eight-year-old uh, in an 800-square-foot apartment didn't sound like justification maybe for sleeping downstairs sometimes? Well, Jackson's only there two or three days a week. I mean, it's not he's, his biological child. It's not his biological child. Uh, they are in the same room, I'll grant you that, but he's with his dad quite a bit. So the days that he is there for, for David to sleep downstairs, that wouldn't be unusual to you? I think if he would have explained that and said, I'm not comfortable sleeping with his mother in front of him, and when he's here, I'm going to sleep downstairs because I'm not comfortable with that, but that wasn't what he said. Did you speak to Ch uh, Shanti's ch uh, college friend? Uh, two of them. Okay. Anybody tell you that Shanti snored like a trucker and that it bothered her, David? Her dad. Her dad. Her stepdad. So you became aware of that. They lived, the David, David and Shanti lived with them for two years, and he slept with her in the bed the entire two years while she snored like a trucker, and Mr. Dow could hear it down at his bedroom. But at the time, didn't bother David because I guess they just met. So he stayed with her those entire two years while she snored like a trucker. And maybe there weren't uh, alternative sleeping arrangements in the parents' house for him? I don't have any idea. Okay. Um, so with that, would you be able to confirm for us that Shanti was not CPAP compliant and she didn't wear it? Um, there was one under the bed, but everyone told us she didn't wear it. So when push comes to shove, after a married couple is married for a little bit, if one wants sleep, sleeping in a separate room is a real problem for you with regards to the state of a relationship? I don't think so. If the main house was done and he sleeps in another bedroom, I don't think that much. I don't think that much about it if it's a sleep thing. But being down in the garage with no air conditioning, on a couch with a couple of dogs in the kennel, I, I just thought that would be very uncomfortable. He, he and intentional, did. and it wasn't his, he wasn't sent down there, he chose. It was a big property? What do you mean? I mean, the yard, had a big yard. He could have slept out by the pool, I guess, in the cabana. It's a huge place. Had an outdoor living space that Beautiful. he could take advantage of? That what? That he, he could take advantage of the outdoor living space throughout he the evening? He could have slept there, I guess, yeah. Well, I'm not talking about for sleeping. I'm talking oh, I'm about sorry. for access to, you know, additional living space. I thought we were still on the sleeping. Okay, so um, yeah, beautiful property, great, beautiful cabana, nice pool area, large property. But there's no evidence that he spent all of his time away from Jackson and Shanti. He ate meals with them, didn't he? Hey, I guess he saw them for a few hours in the evenings, like when she got done working, when Jackson got home, um, either until he got picked up by Jim or until they went to bed. But okay. They went to bed, I guess, fairly early from what he explained. Well, they had an eight-year-old that was sharing the room with them, didn't they? Yes. So wouldn't that explain an early bedtime for all? And maybe explain why David, why David wanted to be downstairs and out of the room? Because Shanti and him went to bed early? Is that what you're suggesting? Because Shanti and Jackson went, went to bed, bed early? early. Yeah. yeah, so he, if he wants to stay awake, I mean, he didn't say that, but yeah, I guess it's possible. Okay, thank you. You were bothered by the fact that Shanti had a job and David didn't. Bothered by it? No, he explained that he was... Semi-retired. Okay, so you, I mean, he doesn't. You, you he made doesn't, note of it, though. 
Well, if he doesn't need to work, he doesn't need to work. I mean, that's, that's benef beneficial to him and the family, I guess. Didn't you essentially look at him like he was the pool boy? Did I look at him like the pool boy, yeah, or did I suggest to him that she was treating him that way? Right, exactly. I didn't look at him as the pool boy, no, sir. You didn't look at it and suggest that the relationship was so odd and that he was marginalized to taking care of the dogs and the pool and he lived in the garage. I made a suggestion to him that that might have been how she was treating him and that he might have been taken exception to how she was treating him. Um, but he didn't say that, that she was treating him that way. You took exception to the fact that he spent his days dealing with the construction, the dogs, the pool and the house, and they didn't have a quote unquote real job that he didn't have a quote unquote real job. Right. I didn't take exception to it. I did point out that that's what he did, that his job was, I guess, the house. He didn't help with Jackson. That's why she hired a nanny. He didn't, he didn't do a lot of the stuff that she needed. That's why she had Sam. He handled the exterior of the home every day. So it's your testimony that he did not have a good relationship with Jackson Cooper? My testimony is that whatever she needed done with Jackson or her business, she hired out. He was there, he was home, but she hired that out. And so you don't believe that David ever assisted with the care for Jackson at all? I, my, from, from what I learned from witnesses, he did when she Thanks went in the Honor. hospital. All for your say. You took note and you questioned him regarding the home renovation, specifically the time and scope of the project. Objection, no question pending. Overruled. Ask again, sir. Isn't it true that you questioned him regarding the home renovation, specifically the time and scope of the project? We, yeah, absolutely. We asked him um, all about the renovation and he offered quite a bit. You suspected frustration and aggravation and tension in the relationship because of it? Because of the uh, length of time they were, they were out of the main house, the, how long it was taking, how many contractors had been let go, um, and how long they'd been living like that. Uh, you fair to say that you suspected that this was their money pit? <laughs> someone did refer to it as that. I can't remember who, but yeah, someone did refer to it as that. I didn't use those words, but someone did. Now, David did give you an account of his day. Isn't that true? Yes. Um, we started on, I believe, Friday. All right. He, let's go to the day, though, of the incident. You, you were able to verify some of the uh, things that he told you about prior to the day of... of um, yes. And, and obviously, she was live, so yes. And that was a trip to Publix? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and some Pub of the Pizza Hut, Publix. And, and what about the, some of the things that... David alluded to with doing yard work around the property um, and maybe locating some tools and stuff uh, when you scanned the bushes and stuff. Explain what your question is. Did you locate a like, knife or tools that were consistent with David's explanation of his, of his chores? We saw the orange-handled iridescent knife in the front plant bed by the um, driveway, and so I asked, it was, uh, it was just left there, so I asked him about it, and he said that's where he left it. You were able to confirm that he was truthful about the, the... I'm not sure what day he was working on that particular plant bed, but when I asked him why it was there, he said he probably forgot to put it back. Right. There was no evidence his knife was used in a crime. Correct, correct. There's nothing on it. It was just laying there. Um, I didn't even know if it belonged to them, but it was theirs, and there was nothing, nothing on it, but I asked him about it, what he, what he does during the day. There was no sharp trauma discovered on Shanti, though, consistent with No, no. Once we went to autopsy, I mean, obviously, we're interviewing him before we go to autopsy, but um, we didn't know what, what that uh, facial injury would be once we got there. David told you he went for a walk with the dogs after seeing Shanti downstairs smoking a cigarette? No, he said he went for a walk by himself, and then he came back and walked the dogs long enough for them to use the restroom, then came back, worked around the house for a little bit, then put the dogs in the RAV4 and drove to Park of Americas. Isn't it true that he told you that he went for a, he walked the dogs and then he went for a walk by himself around the lakes and he walked he, up to Orange around Lafayette, Cherokee, Davis, and another lake no. before returning home? No, he corrected himself. He corrected himself. He said he went for a walk alone and it was um, Orange to Lucerne and then Cherokee, Davis, one other one. You agree the video will speak best for itself? Correct. 
Uh, isn't it true that while he was out walking alone that he bumped into one of the neighbors? Not to my knowledge. Jacqueline Spence, didn't see him walking? I'm sorry? Was it Jacqueline Spence? Yeah, Jacqueline Spence. He didn't run into one of the neighbors. That would be incorrect. Um, Did a neighbor see him walking when she was on her way home from Publix? Not at the time he said he was walking. He, was, he would have already been home. He would have already left and gone to the dog park. She said when she saw him at 1150 on Miller by the Horsehead House, he was behind her home on Miller, and he would have already told us that he had already both lo lo loaded the dogs and gone to the dog park. So, so that was inconsistent. You were holding him pretty hard to the times that he was giving you. You're, you're recording them as if they're gospel when he was sitting there in an interview room. Isn't that well, true? Uh, his words are his words. My job is to verify it. Was the man wearing a watch? I don't know. Uh, I didn't ask Ms. Spence if he was, was he wearing under a watch. a lot of pressure? Objection calls for speculation in the mind of another. Okay. Was there a traumatic experience that happened that day? In his home? Yes. I would say so. Okay. So, and he had been sitting at a police station waiting for you to speak to you for how many hours? From 5 to 9.15. When he came back, he told you that he uh, walked around the house and pool and did landscaping for a while? Um, taking the dogs to the dog park? He, he did, a, little, he did a, a few things around the house. Um, he said his walk was at least an hour. Let's go back to Jacqueline About an hour, Spence. hour and 40 minutes, or hour and 20 minutes. Back to Jacqueline Spence, when she uh, did have an encounter with him, she didn't note any blood or injuries or anything like that on David? Just different clothes. He had light colored clothes on. He had uh, different clothes on when we made contact with him. And when did you interview Jacqueline Spence? It would have been Thursday, Thursday or Friday, the 26th or 27th. And isn't it true that she was somewhat confused and vague about the days and times that she might have seen him? Not at all. With dog or without dog? She didn't remember the, seeing the dog. She didn't remember seeing a cell phone. She didn't remember him seeing carrying anything. She absolutely knew it was him, and she absolutely knew what day it was. And then I went to Publix to verify she was correct on her timeline. David told you he then took the dogs to Park of Americas? Park of Americas on Andes. All right. And in fact, there are cameras at that park, aren't there? I went there three times, yes, sir. But you weren't able to collect any of the footage to corroborate David's timeline? Unfortunately, the city of Orlando does have access to those cameras. Our video analyst has access to those cameras. Um, he checked immediately. It was one of the first things I did. And they weren't operational. They're very overt cameras, but they weren't operational. So I went back three different times, including the, a week later at the time that he said he was there. And I walked the park three separate times to the area where he said he was. And I showed his picture and asked everybody if they saw him, but you know, I can't say that they were there that day, but I just went around and asked just to try and verify that he was there. No, no fault of Mr. Tronis is that the cameras were not functioning? No fault of his whatsoever, but they weren't operational. You found it unbelievable that he left the property for hours on April the 24th? I found it convenient. Or tragic that he wasn't there to protect his wife? Well, it became, I think it became increasingly more irrelevant that he wasn't there because I don't believe that she was alive when he left. You found it unbelievable that David didn't call or text Shanti during the day? Unbelievable? No, I just asked. No, I just asked if they had communication because if they had communication, his cell tower would put him there and that would verify what he's telling us because I didn't have cameras. Not true, that was par, that, that they didn't communicate during the day because Shanti didn't like to be disturbed? That that was what? That, that was the norm. Um, that they didn't text or call each other ever? Yes, because Shanti didn't like to be disturbed during the day. So oh, David he said know. she didn't like to be disturbed during the day, yes. He, he did say that, but she did text people. She texted other people. For work, right? Uh, perhaps, or for picking up stuff at the grocery store like Sam yeah, did. Uh, Samantha Adams confirmed with you that Shanti didn't like to be disturbed during the day? I don't, I don't know that they, she said that she didn't like to be disturbed because she's up there doing the homework with her son. So Jackson's up there, he's playing video games. They're, they're redoing his reading. They're doing his, um, his words for the day. I mean, he's up there, so I don't know that, that that would have been disturbing to her, but she did text people during the day. She texted Sam during the day. Work-related or 
because that, Sam was the nanny. Right. I mean, if, if she needed him to come home and pick up Jackson that day, she could have texted him. But my, my point is, is just not the communication being a problem. It's just if you, if you communicate while you're at the dog park, then your phone's going to put you at the dog park at the time that you say that you're there. That was the only reason I asked. If you used your phone. It would... If you used your phone. So I didn't just ask about Shanti. Right. I said, did anyone call you? Did you text anyone? Did you get on and check your email? Did you get on social media? Did you do anything at all with your phone? And he said he put it in his cooler and left it there. And you found that convenient as well? I found it as a dead end. If he tells us he's there and I can't verify it with his cell phone records or with cameras, then how do I, how do I verify what, he's, what his alibi is? And I can't, but it became increasingly not as important as it was in the beginning. Because pretty quickly you came to develop him as the only suspect. No, not pretty quickly at all. We didn't arrest him for 127 days. It was not quick at all. Uh, you're aware that Shanti had a dental issue on April the 24th. Uh, according to him, she bit into a taco and broke her molar. You confirmed she had a broken tooth? Uh, yes, with the ME. And the fact that she had scheduled an emergency appointment with the dentist? Yes. That she didn't show up to? That she didn't make it to, yeah. And you also took note that she didn't respond uh, to an 6.58 a.m. non-urgent work text. Isn't that true? A six, uh, you're characterizing something as non-urgent. I don't know that that was the case. Um, 6.58 work text would not have mattered to me had Mr. Conley not suggested that um, he expected an answer pretty quickly. Did he that, say that it wasn't urgent? I, I don't recall if he said it was or wasn't urgent, but he, he became very, very, very concerned that he did not get a response from her uh, within the first few minutes when he called me, because he called me, I didn't know who he even existed. He reached out to me because that text was never read. When he found out that Shanti was deceased, he felt it important to let you know that he hadn't received a response from a very early text message in the day, because it could be pertinent. Well, that was why he reached out, but prior to knowing she was deceased, he was Googling her because he thought something had happened to her because he never got a response. So he was already worried about her. His worry aside, I mean, this missed text message is the reason that you set your time of death where you do. Is not true? I didn't set a time of death. I look in, I'm looking at her cell phone. He says she comes downstairs three times. That phone never takes steps. If she's up working at 4 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning, as people suggested she is, and that phone never takes steps, or that phone never takes stairs, so that means she didn't pick up her cell phone. This is a businesswoman who works all night, sometimes 4 o'clock in the morning. She doesn't pick up her phone from 11.30 the night before, 11 o'clock the night before, all night long, and all the next day. She never picks up her phone, and she's running a business that people say she answers like this. She's super responsive. That became important when I heard that. Okay. So we're talking about from 11.30 at night to 6 something in the morning. This is the time frame you're talking about that she was unresponsive and it was alarming and, and peculiar to you. It would be okay. till, until 6.58. Okay, and a text message pops up on the screen. Is it possible that somebody could pick up a phone, read it, and put it right back down with activate, without activating and still have access to the information on in the, an iPhone? In the phone not registering movement? I sure. don't know the answer to that. That would have been a question for the previous person who testified. Okay, so the fact that a step wasn't registered on it, you know, if, if the phone wouldn't register a step based upon a movement like that, then she could have very well been privy to it. And because of her toothache, she didn't care to deal with it right then. I don't know. So she didn't read it the entire day and didn't respond to her colleague? Um, Is that what you're suggesting? No, I, I'm, I'm asking a question and I'd like you to just be responsive to it. The question is, what inference is drawn from the time of the text message if she can pick it up and read it and put it back down without it registering a step on the health app? I don't know if picking it up and reading it, if she would disable a lock, that, those aren't questions. I'm not an expert on that. So if she, has to, if she has to put her face on it to open it to read it, I don't know that her phone would even allow her to read the text. I don't know that she would have to open up her face. If she opens it with her face or her thumb, then yes, that would register. Absolutely, that's registered in the phone, 100%. Detective, you're the so, lead detective in this case, aren't you? I need to finish. So if she looked at that text and decided not to respond to him the entire day, 
that would be inconsistent with her performance previous to every other day of that she owned that business. No one's saying she didn't respond the entire day. Because it was never read, sir. You don't know that it wasn't read. The phone doesn't, doesn't that's show it to be read. Is not true? Sustained argumentative. Still on 424 in the interviewing room, um, you find out at some point during the interview that the uh, CSI Tech Kane did not photograph Mr. Tronis's body without his shirt on, correct? I asked him. I didn't know if he did or not. That's why I asked him. Because you didn't communicate with the, the technician either? Well, I asked him to clip the nails and get a buckle swab, yes. You didn't ask him to take photographs? I, well, of course he was taking photographs. I didn't know that he didn't take photographs without his tank top on. It, would that require a special request normally? Um, possibly. I, different CSIs do different things. Okay, so I think uh, if he, he did photograph an injury on his hand, I think if he would have seen an injury, maybe he would have photographed it. But um, I hadn't had a chance to view his body. You asked Mr. Tronis to review the paper jumpsuit, correct? To do what? To remove the paper jumpsuit so you could observe his chest, arms, and back. I asked him if he was okay with it, if I could view his chest, arms, and back, and then he started to unzip it. And did he show you his chest, arms, and back? He absolutely did. Okay, did you observe some sores and bug bites and some wounds on his back? Yes. Did you photograph them? No, nothing, there was nothing concerning to me that he had injuries sustained from a, a fight or any sort of like, you know, cat scratching or nail scratching. There was nothing on his neck, his chest, his arms, nothing that I felt needed to be photographed. I didn't observe anything but his sores and his skin, his skin disorder. And possibly an explanation as to how the little bits of blood end up on sheets in the bed? His, his blood particularly? We didn't have the sheets. I didn't know the blood was there. Okay. We, we just in, met the man. In hindsight. In, in hindsight, hindsight what? In hindsight. In documenting the wounds on his back, wouldn't it help us to under, wouldn't it help the jury to understand how the blood, his blood comes to be deposited like that on a top sheet and a fitted sheet? It's possible, I guess, if he sleeps in the bed sometimes, yeah. Isn't it evidence that he slept in the bed? Yes. And you interviewed him. We watched it uh, for several hours until you take a break sometime around 12.30 a.m. on April the 25th now. 12.31 in the morning, yes. You had some administrative duties to take care of, but you did not return back to 218 Copeland? Correct. And we talked about uh, Detective McClellan being in training. Were you aware that uh, uh, CSI Crosby's assistant, CSI Taylor, was in training as well? Yes. So of the four of you at the crime scene documenting this, two people were in training? Yes. Two people, uh, I wouldn't say Detective McClellan was in training. She was in our violent crimes unit. Um, in but she. A homicide. She wanted to come to homicide, so she asked to uh, attend this. She was working with um, myself and other detectives when she was available, but she uh, was in a violent crimes unit. She was not an inexperienced detective, and she had quite a bit of experience. You leave David alone in the room until, for another hour and 50 minutes, until 2.20 a.m., some nine hours after he arrives at OPD, uh, mostly alone. We entered at 2.19, and he would have been uh, alone to, to sleep, or if he needed to go use the restroom or get anything, he would have asked the officer. And again, you don't know how much sleep he got? I don't. I just asked him if he slept, and he said yes. He said a little? A little, yeah. He's still wearing the paper suit? Correct. Still just water and crackers? Correct. What did he ask for? He asked me for peanut butter crackers. That's what I got him. Sitting in a windowless room? Yes. Sitting in a cushionless chair? Cushionless chair, yes. Yes, we all were. It's not comfortable. Well, you were in there for a lot less time, weren't you? About six hours, yeah. And how many hours was David in that room? Just shy of 14. During the interview, David acknowledged that Shanti was stiff or 
in rigor upon him first touching her and attempting to remove her from the bathtub. Isn't that true? He said she was very stiff. Um, he said her leg was bent. It was stiff. Her arm was stiff, and her jaw was stiff when he tried to get CPR. So for someone who's never come in in touch with somebody before, that leads you to believe that there's some form of rigor that's beginning, correct? It, what it led me to believe is if you're in the tub and you're in full or partial or full rigor and your leg is bent, then why is your leg not bent when we get there and see her body? And if her arms are down at their sides, then how does he drag her face down with her hands like this? How does he break rigor? Because he couldn't get her mouth open to give her CPR, but he but he got her arms from her sides down up like this to drag her upside down, which means he had to break rigor. And I don't think that's possible because I have handled many decedents in rigor. Detective McClellan, David has no medical training. Detective so, McClellan or Detective sorry, Sprague? Detective, Detective Sprague, excuse me. Pardon me, it's late and I'm tired too. And I'm missing so an appointment, but go ahead. Right. <laughs> so in the world of experience and expertise. He's not an expert and didn't know what rigor was and wasn't able to explain it to you and, and how it came. He used the word stiff, we use the word rigor. So like when he's doing the CPR compressions and he says it doesn't rebound, he's saying it's stiff. When he tries CPR, he's saying it's stiff on her jaw. When he says her leg is bent, he's saying she's stiff. When he pulls her out, he's saying she's stiff. But, but she's in a completely different position when we find her. To what degree and to what extent, if there was an arm in rigor, wasn't there? There was an arm like this in rigor, okay. but and not what, like this when he's dragging her upside down. How does that happen? Well, in, in the world of there was a leg slightly in rigor that you observed as well? No, her knees were raised up in rigor. He says her knee, he or leg was bent at the knee. How does that get straight when we get to her? Well, let me ask you, you asked David to demonstrate uh, on you how that happened, correct? When he was dragging her this direction, I asked him to do it. Right. And then he said that he pulled her out because he couldn't do it. So he couldn't do this. Right. So because her arm was down at her side. So he had to use, he had to go under her arm, under her bicep, under her shoulder to pull her out of the tub. Correct. Onto the floor with her head toward the door. Yeah. But then he has to flip her over. This would be somewhat dead weight. That's what he said. Slippery wet. If she's actually wet. But then he has to break her arm rigor to get her head like this, hands like this. And, and then face her down and then drag her into the other room you keep and then saying, skin her knees. You keep saying broken rigor. Is it possible he was just mistaken as to the extent of the rigor and didn't understand what he was talking about? You if he did this right before we got there? Well, within four and a half, six minutes? Six minutes to call, four and a half minutes later? So he broke rigor. He straightened her leg and he straightened her arms in the midst of a crisis. He did not break rigor because the arm was still in rigor. You don't know what he was describing, it, how, how it was bent. You didn't have him describe how the arm was bent. You didn't have him describe how the leg was I bent. absolutely did. And the best evidence is that video. Great. Thank you. He told you that the water was running at a trickle at first? At for trickle at first and then halfway. Did he, heard it, he heard it as a trickle but saw it to be running? Saw it to be running halfway. And turned it off as Turned he, it off. But the shower was not on. Hold on. Just make sure that we breathe in between so the court reporter can get everyone's words. He recalled seeing the water with the diluted blood, rose-colored water. That's how he described it, yes, sir. He described the best he could the condition and position he found her in. The, I'm sorry? He, he described the, to the best he could the condition and position he found her in. He described it in great detail at our request. He did great. And isn't it true that while you asked for a demonstration, Detective McClellan didn't ask for a demonstration, didn't ask him to show physically with his own body what Shanti was doing, but used this little model on the table? In the tub. Then, then when they used the water bottle, they were describing her positioning in the tub. And it, that's easy to tell what's going on on that table from, from the camera view? As far as what happened between him and Detective McCollin? As, as far as what he was demonstrating, you believe that that's clearly presented in that video? Objection. I don't understand what you're asking me, sir. Objection, best evidence. Thank you. Didn't he describe her as prone, draped over the edge of the tub, with the head down in the tub at one point? To an officer? Yes. When Officer Wilson asked him if she was clothed, he changed her position from in the tub to out of the tub with just her head in the tub when he asked her, him if she was clothed. 
then her body was not in the tub, you just her head was in the tub. You that did change, and they did tell me that. You weren't present for that conversation? That's why he wrote a statement. And wasn't it simply clarifying how much of her was in the tub? And he was, over, he was eavesdropping on a conversation that David was having with the chaplain. Eavesdropping? Well, he's supposed to be there. He's an officer, and they called the chaplain for him. But he did hear that, and he noted the inconsistency with the, her being in the tub closed, which was perked his interest, and then changing the position from her being in the tub soaking wet to just her head and her torso and not her body. Her body was then outside the tub. They noted that consistency to inconsistency to me, and then they stopped asking him questions at that point. Being partially in the tub would be consistent with her clothes and her hair and the rest just being slightly damp and not soaking wet. Isn't that true? No, because if her body wasn't in the tub, then how did her shorts get wet? It changed. Gravity? How about the, how about the yellow towel she was laying on? That wasn't near about her. the mattress pad? No, the, the yellow towel was underneath the mattress pad, sir. And it was pretty wet, wasn't it? And a mattress pad's like a sponge? I, I, I didn't touch the towel because I left and wrote the search warrant. And you didn't touch Shanti Cooper either, did you? I did not. I just observed her. I had um, Ralph Kalachi touch her because it's his jurisdiction, not ours. So his testimony regarding the condition of her clothes, body, and hair would be more reliable? What he, what he told me on scene and what he indicated in this trial would be more consistent because he did it. Okay. Did you read his report? Yes. Once I realized they actually wrote them on Saturday, the Saturday after this occurred. David described the difficulty he had removing Shanti from the tub? Yes. Uh, and given his size and given her size, you found this unbelievable as well? I felt at him at 6'2", 190, and him being allegedly never been happier in his life and in love, he would have scooped her up like a superhero, but he said he couldn't. Isn't it true that he told you during the interview that when he pulled her out that water did not splash onto the floor? The video would be the best evidence of that, that, why, that he got her out of the tub and she landed on the floor. So I think it, we would surmise that water would be on the floor because he rolled her out of the tub and she landed on the floor, head toward the door, and so water should have been everywhere because she was wet, allegedly. Did he tell you during the interview that when he pulled her out of the tub that water did not splash on the floor? I don't recall that, sir. We should rely upon the video again. Absolutely. Fair to say the second portion of the interview was more aggressive than the first? Probably the last, the very end. Out now, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, you guys are rolling into another hour and a half of interrogation after a long, long day? Yes, it was from 2.19 until uh, about 4.56. But ultimately, David wasn't arrested at that point, was he? No, sir. But you, cut, the interview cuts off, I think, with our viewing of it. I think we stopped it somewhere. Three-something. Right, that wasn't when the interview ended though, is it? No. How, long, how much longer did you speak to him? Until 4.56. So almost to 5 a.m.? Correct. So 12 hours, you know, from the time that you, uh, that he originally uh, came to the station, correct? I'm sorry, we didn't interview him for 12 hours. No, we he got to the station. Five hours and 53 minutes. I said the time he got to the station. 12 hours from the oh, time he got to the station. Oh, I thought you said the time he got. Okay, now I'm with you. Um, from the time he got to the station until then would have been 12 hours, and then we brought him home at 7.09. 12 hours in that room, water crackers, unknown amount of sleep. Correct. And it was another two hours before you actually um, drove him home from the station. I didn't drive him home, but I had him driven home by Officer McNutt, yes. Officers drove him home. Officers drove him home. And, and we met him outside and we released the home to him, which is why we didn't take any of the cash. So we talk about the fact that on April the 24th into the morning hours of April the 25th, he sat at the station and voluntarily complied with the requests. Correct. And left the station a free man at 7 a.m. 
just before seven, about six fifty-five, they took him out of the room you and they the drove home him home. And then they drove him home. You released the home to him, yes. In his ma'am. front yard, yes. Asked Nancy. She's just expounding upon it, I'm trying to dial it back. Sorry, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you. When he was released, there were no restrictions regarding the home or the property inside of it? Correct. And isn't it true that David returned to the property and lived there for several days before moving to his mother's residence? I don't know the answer to that. Weren't you surveilling the property? Not until Friday. And at which point there was another search warrant executed on April the 30th of 2018, correct? It was submitted Sunday night on the 29th and approved Sunday night, and we executed it on Monday the 30th. At that point, the sheets were still there? Which set of sheets? All the sheets that you saw yeah. originally? Uh, yes. Okay. But it was a month later, on May the 24th, that you execute this third search warrant? Correct. And at this point, you still don't know, you still think you're missing something? I still think we missed blood on the bed. You don't know where it started and when it happened? Where what started? The, this, this attack? Uh, somewhere between the shower and the side of the bed and the floor. But where, where, where the initial blow to her face or head, the side of her head, or her cheek, or the eyes. I don't know where it first started, but if it started, there should have been blood spatter, I thought, or something that would indicate a starting point that we, because we had drainage, but not a starting point. If it was in the shower, we wouldn't know because it was diluted. We, it could have started in the shower, but we didn't know because it was diluted. I still felt we were missing blood on the bed. Just based on listening to his interview, I just felt we were missing blood on the bed. You processed the shower the first day because you see the blood ring uh, on the base of the tub, correct? I asked them to use uh, a reagent, yes. What about on the wall itself? Yeah, they the they did, yeah, right? they did. So at that point, and do you know the difference between uh, cast off blood and blood spatter? Yes, but once blood spatter is diluted with water, you're not going to know if it's cast off blood or, or, or expirated blood from being hit with the nose and the mouth. Once it's diluted with water, the pattern is gone. It no longer tells the same story. And the stains on the walls of the, bath, of the bathtub? All diluted. Isn't it true that when enhanced that some were darker than others? I don't know that I can speak to that. That would be more of a CSI question. When you were searching the property, did you locate a poker bag? And I'll go back to, you could say, the 24th of April, the 30th of April, or the 24th of May. Did you locate a poker bag with cash in it inside of Shanti's closet? No, we didn't learn about the poker bag from Sam until after we released the house on the 30th, and we interviewed her at 4.33 on Monday the 30th. That's when she mentioned that with the four or $500 in cash. We did look for it. I believe Detective McClellan and I, one of us, looked for it on the 24th just to back up what Sam was saying. We had no idea what she was talking about. I don't know what a poker bag looks like, and we didn't find it. Did you get a description from her, any assistance from yeah. her in finding it? No, no. I'm just her description that she gave us. Okay. You never um, but followed we, up with her? No, we looked for it. We just couldn't find it. So we just missing. looked in the closet for something that had something that you could put money in, but we never found it. Um, but she didn't say it was absolutely there. She said that that was a routine when she made deposits from Shanti's business that she might ask her to get a cash advance or cash from the deposit and that she would put it there. But she only saw her do it once. So she didn't know that was something she did all the time. What about uh, clothing upstairs? There's how many closets? Two. Men's clothes in one of the closets? Yes, sir. Thank you. So evidence that David kept his property up there and at least up there to get oh, the wraps and stuff? Oh, there was a ton in the garage as well. I mean, look at the refrigerator. There was all his tank tops were hanging up on there. His, he had stuff in both places. This is a laundry room too, right? What is? The garage area? No, it is not. The laundry uh, dryer, the washer was in the driveway, and the dryer was in the back. At what point did you test the washer dryer for the presence of blood? I asked the CSIs to do that, I believe, on the 30th. Did they find any? No, no, and that was something that happened in another case of mine, so I asked them to swab it because it, it had been fruitful in another case after something had been laundered. In fact, there was a fourth search warrant executed some four months later at a different location, wasn't there? Are you talking about at his, at his mother's house? Correct. That would have been on um, August 29th, the day he was arrested. 
So four months after the 520, or I'm sorry, four months after the 424. Four months later. Incident. Thank you. And David was living at that house at this point? Appeared to be, yes. And you know that because you found some personal belonging, belongings of his in one of the bedrooms? Yeah, a lot of his personal belongings, yes. Including Shanti's ring? Yes. Was the ring reported stolen? No. There was no insurance claim placed on this ring? I don't know that they had insurance on the ring. David had assets, didn't he? What do you mean? I mean he wasn't cash poor, was he? No. What was the value of the ring? About 15000 11 to 15000 How much cash did David have on hand? Him specifically, or the com I know the, co the combined income or the combined assets was start about. With him. How, how about him specifically? I, I, I don't recall about uh, maybe 130, 150,000. That's, that's all you believe that David had? I don't, I don't recall. I know she had three or 400,000, but combined is what I remember, and it was about 798,000. And what about the value of the home? He paid 675, I believe. What about retirement policies and such? I don't know. You made a big deal about the location of this ring because you felt that you'd been searching for it for 127 days, even though it hadn't been reported missing. It was pried off her cold, dead hand. Yes, I was very concerned about it. Says who? She was wearing it the day before. She wore it every day. Says who? The evidence in my case. And these po people that you spoke with, they were present with Shanti at her wake-up routine and her bedtime routine and her shower routine? I was told she never took it off. And even he said it was on her hands. He told us it was on her hand. He thought it was on her hands? That's what he said to you? No, he told us it was on her hand. You didn't detect any injury to her ring finger to suggest that a ring was pried off her finger? No. After a body passes, it typically bloats? I didn't notice bloating in her hands and, f and her toes at all, no. You made a big deal about locating a passport uh, in the bag with the ring and some cash. Isn't that true? With the ring? Um, the cash was in a Ray-Ban sunglasses case, and his passport was there, but I don't think it was in the suitcase with the ring, now. Isn't it true that the passport expired in 2007? I don't know if it did or didn't. His, uh, I mean, we took a photograph of it, but I don't know that I paid attention to when it expired. But it, there were rolls of cash in that, in that sunglasses How bag. How much cash? I don't know. Not a pile of cash that you're expecting. Any airline tickets? Any air airline tickets located with the cash and passport? N no, and, and it was really irrelevant. He has money at his disposal, so. So this wasn't suggestion of sign of flight or anything of the kind? He had four months to flee. He didn't flee. And while you were still trying to figure out where it happened and why it happened, by this time you were pretty fixed on who you believe committed the uh, offense. I, I followed the evidence. It's not my, it's not my job to make of something fit that doesn't fit. You follow the evidence. I teach homicide investigation, sir. You follow the evidence. You eliminate people along the way. I could never eliminate him, and all of the evidence led to him. You were able to confirm what David explained to you about the life insurance policies? It was 350000 He thought it was two fifty. Hers was 350000 And wasn't his actually a million and a half and not a million? I thought it was a million, but it could be a million and a half. But you were able to confirm that he had cash and assets. Both of them did, yes. He didn't have the, he didn't sell the ring and he didn't destroy it. Correct. Um, photographs and looking at David's hands and bodies, it didn't sh they didn't show any signs of being involved in a prolonged violent attack, did they? No. 
No, she didn't have any defensive wounds and he didn't have any injuries.